Okay, there we go. Good morning, my name is Doug Hellman. Um, I'm here <coughs> to talk a little bit about a project that I created called Smiley. Um, but uh, more importantly, what I want to talk about today um, is how I created this project, um, the, the sort of the life cycle that I went through with, with creating it. Um, so uh, Smiley is a, a debugger for Python programs that runs inside of your process and it records everything that it does. So it records every call that's executed, every line that's executed. It records all of the variables and all of the data and the state change and everything. Um, it writes all of that to a database and then you can peruse it with a, a graphical interface and, and sort of understand what happened in each execution of your program. Um, before I go into a lot of detail, I want to really set expectations, though. I'm not going to do a deep dive into all of the technologies that I used to build the, the tool. Um, I, I do want to talk about how the tool evolved and the life cycle. So a lot of conference talks are sort of, I built this thing, here it is. Um, those are really good talks, and it's why a lot of us come to these conferences, to learn about new tools that are out there and, and understand what people are doing in the community. Uh, but that's not what this talk is. If I created a talk like that, I would have used a much shorter title. Um, I want to talk about the how, because I want to talk about, uh, for, for sort of new developers, to understand that projects don't come into the world fully formed. You start with nothing, and you build it up over time, and you evolve it. Um, I, I find a lot in uh, the local Python meetup with newer developers, they don't really understand the idea that you can start with something simple and end up with something complex. They sort of want to try to understand the whole thing at the beginning of the process. And so um, I'm, I'm starting to sort of talk about this with, with developers uh, at, at the local meetups, and so I want to share that here too. Um, so <clears throat> the project, as I mentioned, is called Smiley. Um, it's up on GitHub. Um, I'm going to show some of its code. Um, but I'm not going to do you know, a complete walkthrough of all of the code. I'm going to talk about the history. Um, starting with, first things first, what, what's up with the name, right? Um, I think of Smiley as spying on your program. So I started looking for spy names for the project. And this one is really obvious. And so I wanted to go a little bit deeper and, and come up with something different. Um, George Smiley is a John Le Carré character in, in several of his novels. He's a little bit more intellectual. He's a lot less flashy. Um, he focuses sort of on the spying rather than the blowing things up. And that's a little bit more my style. So I thought that was a good name. Um, so with that out of the way, I started to think about all of the features that I wanted to put in the project. Um, I, I, from the beginning, I wanted to see where I was going to go at the end but I, I, so I could map out a path. But I didn't want to sort of uh, figure it all out up front. I, wanted to, to let it evolve. Uh, but I knew that eventually what I wanted was something that sort of combined the best of print-based debugging with an interactive debugger like PDB. So with PDB, you can see what all your, your variables are, um, but you have to sort of interactively step through and, and put uh, uh, breakpoints and continue, 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 and, and run the program over and over again and that sort of thing. And I didn't want to have to do that. Um, I wanted to be able to collect data about programs that were not running on my local computer. So something running on a, on a server somewhere remotely. Um, and then I wanted to collect all of the data in a way that let me look at it over time and compare runs and understand why different inputs and ended up taking different paths in the code. And uh, frankly, I was also motivated to kind of try and build something a little bit audacious. And it seemed like building a tool that collected everything that ever happened in your Python program was kind of an audacious thing to do. And I wanted to learn some new tools along the way. Um, so to start out, I, I knew about Python's built-in trace API. It's, it's, uh, there's an interface there in the sys module. You can tie in and, and understand what's happening in your, in your Python program using that. I'd used it before. Um, I've done network programming before, sending data across the socket. Um, but I hadn't really used uh, ZeroMQ before. And I thought, well, this is a good sort of opportunity to introduce a new tool. So I started looking into ZeroMQ as the first step. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time reading documentation and sort of dinking around with little test scripts and, and sample things that are not saved in the Git repository for, for Smiley. Um, 
and I kind of started out having no idea what I was doing with this, the library and, and sort of faking it and making things work and breaking them again. And um, I, based on the documentation, I thought, well, I'm going to want to use PubSub because I might want to have uh, my process that's actually being traced, uh, collecting data and sending it to a bunch of other places. Maybe different things are happening at the same time. Um, but then as I started experimenting with it, I realized, oh, well, PubSub, I'm losing the beginnings of a lot of my traces because it doesn't guarantee delivery as that socket is set up. So I switched to a push-pull setup. Um, so that was sort of my first lesson figuring this stuff out was that sometimes you're getting the things wrong. You make the wrong choice and you have to change things. So, um, so I created a pair of classes well, using the push-pull sockets that I could use to send arbitrary data between two processes. So the, the socket, uh, the push-pull things, they, they want nice byte streams, but uh, I needed to be able to send anything. So I created a couple of classes to help layer on top of that. So after I had the, the publisher and listener, um, I, I started with the tracing. Um, that was really going to be the meat of what Smiley was. So I created a tracer class that uses those two communication classes to publish data about what's happening inside uh, the program. And the way that works is it installs a, a function to be called every time the Python interpreter takes any action. So anytime a function is called, anytime the, any line of your source, your program is executed, um, when a function returns, if there's an exception generated, any of that stuff, it, it's going to call your function and tell it about what's happening. And it passes to it uh, the stack frame, so you have access to everything that's happening there inside the other part of the program. And you get information about what kind of event was happening. And some of the events like uh, return and um, exception, there's extra arguments to pass you some data that's not going to be available in the stack frame. So uh, that's what that third argument there is. So once I, I get my notification that something's happened in the program, um, I call send notice, uh, which does three things for me. This is, this is where all the communication is actually happening. So first of all, it figures out, do I care about this line of code? Um, I, I thought at first I probably didn't care about the standard library. I wasn't going to really trace down into the sys module or, or any of those other sort of standard modules. Um, so I was excluding things based on file name and where it was located and things like that. And I've, I've evolved that a little bit over time, but uh, it's still basically file name based. Um, so if it decides that the file is interesting, uh, then it builds a list of the local variables that I want to uh, pass through. So the, the stack frame that you're given in the trace call includes all of the stuff in the namespace for the point at which it, the code is being executed. So you can get access to all the modules that were imported. You have all the local variables. You have all the classes. Uh, anything that's in that namespace where the line of code that's being traced uh, is available there. But I didn't want all of those things. So I don't care about all the imported modules. I don't care about the classes or the methods or functions because I'm going to go read the source code somewhere else. I'm going to actually read the text of the source. So uh, so I filter those things out, and I just save everything else that's in the local stack. Um, and then uh, it builds a, a standard data structure. So all of the messages coming across the, the socket look the same. Um, at this point, uh, in the process of developing this, I know I'm going to eventually write this to a database, but I don't really care what the schema looks like right now. So I, I just use a flat dictionary, and it's just got a couple of keys to tell me where, the where in the code I am and what the variables are at that point. So trying to just keep it really simple. And it also includes the event name, uh, which is the, the like line or, or uh, exception or return. And I created a couple of special events for starting a trace and ending a trace, just so that I could uh, sort of stick with the event naming system, but uh, add a couple of events that Python doesn't really know about that I would need in order to record the data properly. So the next step then was to build some kind of a UI. So I have a bunch of classes that are independent and they can do things, but I don't have any way to actually run them uh, interactively. So I needed a user interface. And I started with a simple command line interface um, based on argparse, just some simple separate scripts. Uh, but then I thought about it and I realized that sort of down the road, eventually I would want to make Smiley extendable and I would want a bunch of commands and I didn't want them all to be implemented completely independently um, so I switched to using a framework called Cliff that we created in the OpenStack community for some tools that we're building there. And Cliff also uses argparse for parsing command line arguments. But each of the individual commands that your application supports 
are implemented using a setup tools entry point. So you can have plugins that are implemented in completely separate packages by someone else and distributed and installed separately, and they plug into your application and extend it in different ways. And I thought, as a developer tool, that would be a really useful feature to have. So Cliff was already available, um, and I wrote a lot of it, so I knew how to use it, so I went ahead and, and chose to build it all on top of Cliff. So I'm building my user interface. I need a command line program that's gonna run um, a program and trace its output, so I have a run command. Um, this is gonna publish to the zero MQ socket, and then I need a monitor command that's gonna listen for all of those messages, and the first version of the monitor command just literally prints things to the console. So it takes what it receives and it prints exactly that out on the console. Um, both of the commands default to using a localhost socket, but uh, because there's a command line argument there and I'm using zero MQ, I can just pass it a different URL and I immediately have my remote monitoring feature. So from the very beginning, that was, that was built in because of that tool choice. So the monitor command sets up a listener and it calls this method process message. And process message has a big if statement based on the event type, it does something different. It's gonna format the data a little bit differently because uh, even though the message content format is uh, the same for every message type, the contents are a little different and sometimes I don't care about some of the values. There's no real start or, or uh, line number in the start message, for example. So. Um, this is a pattern that shows up a couple of different places in Smiley where I look at that event type and take a different action. I've got if statements and, and branching and that sort of thing. I thought at this point about creating classes for each event type so that I could instantiate a class and have that class do something for me. Um, but the, the events, the messages don't really have any behavior of their own. They're really just data. There's no uh, the formatting or writing themselves to the database. All of those are separate concerns. And so I didn't really want to bake them into my data classes. And at some point, I would still have to have a big if statement like this. It would take the message type and figure out which kind of class to instantiate. And I thought, if I'm going to be doing that all over the place, I might as well just use the uh, event type and do the action in, right in, in place. And that keeps my messages really simple and it, I, I'm working with simple dictionaries at, the, at that point. So I've got classes in a bunch of other places that are useful, but I decided that the messages didn't need to be their own classes. So to test Smiley, at this point I have enough. I, I can actually try this on a program, so I created a simple little test script. It's just got a couple of functions. They call each other, they return some values. There's a couple of loops. Uh, there's a generator up there at the top. Um, just enough to sort of give me something interesting to uh, look at edge cases and that sort of thing. So now in one terminal I can run smiley run simple.py and then in another terminal I run smiley monitor and it prints all of the, the data that is coming through across the wire as the program runs. Uh, it's not especially readable because I didn't do a great job of formatting it. This is a very, very early version of the output. Um, but you can see it includes the event types, it includes um, file names and line numbers, so I know where in the source code it is. And then later on in the output, when um, it's actually inside of a function, it shows the name of the function as well. So all of the data that I care about is there, even though it's kind of formatted, uh, kind of crummy. Um, so at this point, I have a fully functioning run command that traces a program, sends the results to a separate program, possibly running on a remote system, which then prints all of that information out to the console. So it's interesting, it's a, it's a fairly complete, but it's not really a minimum viable product for a debugging tool because it's basically just doing a bunch of logging on a, a system where you would not be capturing that in any useful way. Um, so the next step was to figure out where, I, where else I was gonna send that output and, and what I was gonna be able to do with it. So I decided, as I mentioned, I was gonna want a bunch of different commands to do different things. I had this plugin framework that let me do that. Um, so I started doing a little bit of cleanup work from what I had. Uh, and so as a, a side note, the, what I'm showing in the source code, in the slides rather, is the source code as it evolved. So if you go and look at the Git repository right now, it's probably not gonna look a whole lot like this in, in most cases. So I'm actually showing you the old versions of the output and the old versions of the code as it evolved at different points. Um, 
I'm not going to talk about refactoring all of the individual lines and things like that. The Git history is all there. I'm just going to really talk about the conceptual stuff, the, what I was thinking as I was doing it. So, um, so I needed to decide how I was going to write to logs or write to a database in some way that, that archived the data. Um, thinking about the database, I, I've used ZODB in the past. I've used MongoDB in the past for different applications. Both of those are good databases. Um, they were not quite what I needed for this because the query semantics were a little bit different. Um, I knew that at some point in a browser interface, I was going to want to be able to pull out just part of a trace, um, especially for a really long running program that's going to generate a lot of data. So I didn't want to have to pull in the whole document representing the whole trace and uh, getting ordering and things like that right in some of those document databases when you split things up can be a little tricky. So I thought I probably want a relational database. Um, I didn't want to have to depend on an, a separate service like MySQL or Postgres because I wanted this to be able to run on a desktop. I, did, I didn't want you to have to spin up a bunch of stuff in order to run this tool. So I wanted you basically just to be able to download it and run your program through it. So SQLite was a great option there. It's built into the Python standard library. It's just available. Um, it's certainly fast enough for this application. So uh, I don't use an ORM in Smiley, but I do have a database API class. So the queries are all really pretty straightforward. It's either inserting something or updating a row um, or selecting sort of everything or, or some subset of everything. So it's, using an ORM felt like it was a little bit heavy. Um, I, and I'm not really scared to write SQL statements myself. So I, I just did that by scratch. Um, I do make some assumptions like, because it's a desktop development tool, if the database doesn't exist and you've told me to write to a database file, I'm just going to create the database for you because you've clearly told me to write to this database. So there's no separate step of make a database and then put things in it, like you might have in a server app where you're talking to MySQL. Um, I don't right now have any schema versioning because I'm still in this early stages of development with the tools. So if I added a column or added a table or something, I just deleted the database that I had and sort of started over and let it make it a fresh one. Um, I do store the schema definition in a separate text file inside the application. I know a lot of folks just put sort of strings inside of Python modules, but I, I wanted to put it in a separate file so my editor would do syntax highlighting for me because it's kind of a nice feature. Um, I started out with two pretty straightforward tables. So the, the run table holds all the metadata about a run, like when it started and when it stopped and what the exit value was and things like that. And then the trace table holds the complete trace data. So that's where all the variables are being stored, all of the individual trace events. Uh, the database API, though, is based on the logical operations around that data. So um, there's a start run method, but it doesn't take all of the the arguments for that method are not complete to fill in a, a total row in that run table because you don't know the end time when you start recording a run, things like that. Um, the, the first version of the database API literally only had the method to start a run. It didn't record any of the other data. Um, but what that let me do was build a database application where I could prove that that data I was getting from a separate process was coming across the 0MQ socket, and I was receiving it, and I was writing it to the database, and I was committing it correctly so that I knew all of my transaction handling was correct. So I didn't worry about writing everything into the database because I wanted to focus on just the transaction handling and make sure I was actually opening and closing the database correctly and things like that. Um, eventually, I, ex I created a, a record command, um, and that class has a method, a method for processing the messages that are coming in uh, over the socket. And again, we see the same pattern here where based on the message type, I'm going to call a different method uh, to do something with it in the database. This command is the only place, though, where I have to know about, at the same time, both the line uh, protocol where the messages are coming over the, the wire in a certain format and the database API. So I, I only have one place where I have to think about both of those things at the same time. So after I had enough uh, pieces working to record the, the, the start of the run, I could update it to uh, include the rest of the database API calls that I would need and, and extend the database API to end a run and to record all the trace data. Um, and I did each of those in a separate step. Um, they're pretty isolated little chunks of, of code, but 
by focusing on one thing at a time, I was able to really literally just focus on that one aspect. So I was either learning how to use zero MQ at the very beginning, or I was learning how to uh, manage the tr database transaction by focusing on just one database call. And then I was dealing with thinking about the individual database API calls that I needed as separate steps as well. And each, each step along the way, I only needed to think about either one tool or one part of my API. So I, I was able to maintain focus on what I was doing. All right, so now I have a program that will record um, program runs. Um, and I had to think about what I wanted to do next. So uh, I'm, I'm recording a bunch of data. Uh, and so I have basically two options. I could start building the program that was going to replay that so that I could sort of see what had happened in a previous run. Or I could think about uh, more complex data types. So what I mean there is, for example, in the run table, I record the traceback if a program dies with an exception. But at this stage, I'm really only recording the single line error message that the traceback reports. Because a traceback is actually kind of a complex data structure. It's got a stack trace and uh, a bunch of line numbers and, and strings and things associated with it in order to represent the whole traceback. Um, I, so I had a column to, to put that data in, but I was only storing the simple string in it, just enough to sort of test that the error case was actually working correctly. Um, so I have these two options, and I thought about what order I should do them, and I decided, well, if I'm going to create uh, a bunch of changes that deal with more complex data types, then anything that I'm doing to format output in a replay command might break if I built that first. So I decided to deal with the database, uh, sorry, the, the complex data types first and come back to replay as a second, a later step. So I started writing, uh, the, the line protocol uses JSON, so I started using some custom JSON encoding logic. And this is literally the entire custom code. Um, most of the data was simple types, and if you provide a function that will convert something that's not a simple type into a simple type, then the JSON encoder can deal with it for you. Um, the traceback module has a, an extract TB function that is tailor-made for doing exactly what I needed. So it, it turns a traceback into a sequence of the lines and, and line numbers and things like that that you need. Um, so that, that, those turn them into then simple JSON representable types. Uh, for classes and other sorts of uh, higher level objects that are types, I decided I didn't really care too much about those. I mentioned I'm going to pull the source code in from uh, the actual source files, so I don't need to try and represent that at, at this point. So I just use a wrapper just so that I have some reference to the class. Um, and then instances of things that are not simple types, though I do want all of their attributes. So I pull all the attributes out, and then I add a couple of extra values there for the class name, and then in case the class name is not unique, I add the module name as well, so that I can uniquely identify, you know, if I have two instances of a foo class, I can tell which, which class it actually is. So with this, now I'm able to send fully complex data across my socket and record all of that, um, but I still had no way to replay the data. So I can get it into the database, or I can write it directly to the console, but I can't get it out of the database and put it on the console so that I can look at it. Um, I knew I had a bunch of formatting code in that monitor command, so I started by refactoring that implementation out into its own module so I could reuse it. Um, and at, at this point, I had a sort of epiphany. Um, it's kind of a small... start a run, to end a run, and then to record some step of the run in the trace. Um, and I used the ABC module to make that an abstract base class so that uh, I, I wasn't going to really share any base implementation. There's no details between the impl implementations of those things that I could really share. So uh, abstract base class lets me enforce the API in all of the places where I'm using it so I can be sure that I'm actually reusing that API correctly. All right, so now uh, I've got my 
output format are refactored to use my new API, and I can go work on the replay command, except I realized at this point there's no way for me to get uh, runs out of the database um, because I, I had not built anything in the database API to do any queries yet, and I didn't have any way to get a run ID out in order to dump the trace for that run. So uh, I, I had been testing sort of by hand. I wasn't doing a lot of test-driven development. Um, this was all fun weekend stuff, so I was just kind of goofing around with it. So uh, I'd been just looking at the database directly and running simple queries just to get IDs and then sort of experimenting with, with queries there. Um, but I started extending the database API in order to support listing runs. Um, then I could build a list command, and with that I had the output on the console that I could copy and paste to give arguments to a replay command. Um, and the replay command turned out to be pretty straightforward with that new event processor API. This is literally the entire replay command. Um, basically get the run argument from the command line, get the run data from the database, loop over the trace data, and print the start and the stop at the beginning and the end. So one of the um, features of both the monitor and replay commands is showing the line of source. So we talked about I'm not going to send classes across the wire, but I do want to show the source code as things are executed. Um, so that you have the context. You have a bunch of variable names. You have line numbers and things. But you want the context to understand what statement's actually being executed as variables change. So uh, I implemented this using the line cache module from the standard library, which is a, a pretty straightforward module. Uh, it reads a file, and then you access it by saying, give me line n of that file. Um, and it caches everything internally, so you don't have to manage a cache yourself. Um, but I realized, as I was experimenting and, and continuing to develop the, the replay command, that if I ran a reran a run that was really old, I was getting the wrong lines. I wasn't seeing the right values, because the, the code of the program I was actually running the test over was changing as I added new things to it and experimented some more. So uh, I realized that I was actually going to need to store the source code for the program that was being run in the database with the run trace so that I could print the right value of the line from the time of the run. Um, so uh, I added some calls to the database API to let me store the source code. Um, and then I created a new DB line cache class, which has the same API as the line cache module, but reads from the database instead of from the file system. It's not really very complicated. This is the whole class. Um, but by designing it to map to the same API, I was able to swap this class in without changing any of the rest of the code from the program. So I was able to get the correct line values and, and line contents. Uh, without having to change the way the output formatter worked or the replay command worked. So at this point, I have been evolving the program over several different sessions. I've been running monitor and run commands over and over and over again. Um, I was getting tired of using them as two separate commands. Um, it turned into be kind of a tedious way to develop the thing. Uh, I wanted to keep a separate monitor command for dealing with the remote debugging. But for local runs, I knew that if I told the run command how to write to a database, it could just write to a local file, uh, a local database, and that would make development simpler. So uh, since the database API um, is de derived from that same event process or base class, uh, I knew if I instantiated a database object and passed that instead of a formatter, the, the run command and the monitor command, they, they would all just work the same way. So this is the change that I had to make in order to uh, make the, the uh, record command, the run command, write to a local database. Um, I added a little flag, and then I have a, an if statement that says, am I writing remotely, use a socket, am I writing locally, use a database. Um, so that's another case where using the same API let me get a lot of code reuse and, and uh, without having to refactor a whole bunch of other parts of the project. So now I had something that was usable for very simple Python programs. And as I was building it, an iterative pattern was emerging in, in the process of what I was doing. So I learned to use some new tool. Um, I built something with it. And then I spent a while sort of fixing it and enhancing it and evolving it. Um, it's not, you know, obviously that's a model. It's not really a perfect description of the way things worked. Um, but it's generally how I approach the, the process. Um, 
I've talked about nine of these different iterations already, um, starting with the basics of 0MQ and then SQLite, and moving on to various different uh, enhancements and, and usability features. Um, over the course of those nine more or less cycles, I built up quite a database of test runs, as you can imagine, and I started to realize that a command line interface for browsing those was less than optimal. Um, so I, I started thinking about what I would want um, for a better user interface. And so I decided that the next major cycle that I would be going through would be building a web interface for it. Um, so as with the command line tools, I, I really didn't want to build everything from scratch. So I looked at, uh, I'm, I'm not a web designer by any stretch of the imagination, so I looked at different CSS frameworks. Um, I had used the pure CSS framework on my blog fairly recently around this time, um, but I decided that um, the Bootstrap library actually had some better widget support, and so I switched to, to using Bootstrap for this. Um, and then I chose Pecan as a web framework, and we, we had done some work with that in uh, OpenStack, and I know the developers um, through the Atlanta meetup, um, so I knew that if I needed help, I had folks sitting fairly close to me uh, that, that could help me out with it. Uh, Pecan, however, uses the Mako templating engine by default, and I hadn't really used that before, so um, I had to spend a little bit of time both figuring out Mako and figuring out Bootstrap uh, before I was able to actually get a sort of a, a useful looking page to show up. Um, the first view that I created um, was basically reproducing the list command, but in a web page. So listing all of the runs that are available. Um, so it shows the, it might be too small for you to read. Uh, it shows the table, the, the run IDs, the uh, times, the outcome. Um, and I, I liked it a little better. I was able to style it a little bit so I could tell where errors had happened and things like that. So I liked it better than the console program. Um, the next step was to turn those uh, run IDs into links um, so that I could create a view that showed the trace data. So this is the uh, in individual run showing the lines that have been executed and all the variables in that far right column. There don't happen to really be any on the first slide. Um, I wanted, uh, what, what I didn't have in the console app, I was sort of assuming you would have an editor handy so you could look at the source code yourself. But in, in the web app, I thought, well, you're looking at it in a web page, maybe you don't have that source code handy. So I wanted to show the source code for each module so that you could look at the whole thing in context in addition to seeing the individual lines. So I added a view for that. Um, plain text is kind of boring, so I looked at the pigments library and I hooked that up so that I could get syntax highlighting. Um, and that was actually pretty straightforward. Just read the source out of the database, uh, pass it to pigments to highlight, and then stuff it into the template, um, which already had the CSS uh, and, and sort of HTML wrappers that I needed. Um, the results, uh, like I said, I'm not a web designer, so it could probably use some help from somebody that is, uh, but it looked a little bit better than just the plain text. It was a little more challenging to do the same thing for an individual line of the source code in the trace view, because Pigments doesn't always know how to parse a single line of Python code. If it's a snippet of code or if it's a part of an expression or something, Python isn't going to know, or sorry, Pigments isn't going to be able to parse it correctly and, and figure out what's what. So um, I wanted to feed the whole source file to Pigments to get the syntax highlighting correctly. I figured if I pass the whole file, there's no possible way that I could be parsing it or incorrectly. Um, so I, I noticed that Pigments was creating output with, um, it was maintaining the line ordering and each line of Python source was on a line of the HTML output as well, but it had a little prefix and a little suffix at the end of the block. So I, I created a, another line cache implementation that wraps up the database again and passes the data through pigments and then strips off the header and the footer. So then I can index into the results as the individual line and get the same line that was uh, that the line cache module or my other DB cache. Uh, DB line cache module would have, would have given me. Um, again, because I used the same API, I was able to drop that in and replace the old version. So instead of the DB line cache, I used the, the syntax highlighting version and I get syntax highlighting in the trace output there. Um, I did something similar. I created a, a template uh, filter that I could give to the template context so that I can get syntax highlighting in the variable output there in the far right column. 
that was a little bit simpler because I was formatting that data and I knew I was building it as valid expressions. So um, I didn't have to worry about uh, parsing it separately. Um, this is mostly useful for strings, but it's also, um, there are a few keywords that pigments picks up and highlights like none and self and a couple of other things like that. So, All right, so now I have a version of this that, where I can see what my program's doing. I can browse through the trace output cleanly. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was make it easier to figure out where it was spending all of its time. I sort of had this long sequence of, of trace statements, but I, I wanted to start, a do, start doing some analysis of that. Um, so I looked again um, at the Python profiler module, and I had originally thought I was going to have to build a lot of the profiling features myself, because it was tying into the trace hook. I was kind of already intercepting what Python was doing. Um, but when I looked at the APIs again, I realized, oh, they're using completely separate hooks. So I can use both of them at the same time. So instead of going and spending a lot of time building a profiler, I just turned on the existing profiler and collect the data and ship it over the socket and write it to the database so that it's there. And then I can print a nice table in my web view. Um, and then after I showed this to some of the folks locally, Ryan Petrello told me how to generate a visualization of that same data using the gprof to dot command. So I get a nice graph as an image which loads up in your browser and it's got colors that indicate where you're spending different amounts of time so you can sort of identify the hot spots in your program. Um, so this led me sort of to another end of a cycle and I was kind of at a plateau with building new features uh, and I needed to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, I was ready to move on to the next step in, this, in that uh, evolutionary cycle and I decided to shift from adding major features. Up to this point, I kind of built big features one at a time, but I decided to shift from that to enhancing some of them and sort of making them a little bit nicer. Um, for example, I noticed the web UI was showing a lot of the same data over and over again. So the, the variables didn't change a lot in my particular test program. And I think that's probably going to be common. You have long stretches of source code where some variable doesn't change. Um, so I wanted to make the web output, at least, only show variables that had actually changed as you go along. Um, and I also was thinking about how important comments are in understanding what's happening in a program. So along with the source that's actually executed, I wanted to be able to show comments that were near the, the code. So I started with the piece to detect changes in variables. And the first version of this used uh, diff-lib, which is a standard library module. Um, and I, I created a sorted list of all of the variables and their representations, and then I asked diff-lib to tell me which variables had been added or changed, and those were the ones that I showed. Uh, I've simplified this a little bit in the most current version of it, um, but at, at the time this seemed like a really good implementation because it let me remove that duplicated data um, and by comparing sort of the previous lines set of local variables with the current lines set of local variables. So anytime um, execution enters or leaves a function, it automatically triggers redumping uh, because your context has changed, the list of variables has changed, so you're going to get the local context again, and that's useful. But within a function, you're only going to get values that have changed inside that function. So now, though, I have a lot of output with no real variables in that right column because I've, I've stripped out all the duplicates. So that actually gave me an idea to collapse those rows together and sort of show them as a block of source instead of individual lines. So I wrapped the iterator that I had that was pulling the trace data out of the database with a, another generator that uh, collapsed the data and aggregated it together. Um, then I extended my uh, line cache classes so that they had a get lines method to retrieve multiple lines at, a, at the same time. Um, and then I also extended them to include the comments with a little simple search algorithm that sort of starts at the beginning and looks backwards until it sees something that doesn't look like a comment. Um, I, I realized at this point I was doing a lot of processing in the user interface layer and the, uh, the program as I was looking at my trace output it was starting to feel a little bit slow. Uh, and I knew that as my program length grew that was really only going to get to be a worse problem. Um, so I decided to add pagination of the output as another feature, as a first step to address that. Um, after I had that working, I 
looked at multi-threaded programs. So I could collect the thread name for every line of your program that's executed. And then in the UI, you can filter that based on what thread you care about. So if you're debugging a multi-threaded application, you can filter it down to just look at the threads that seem to be producing errors. But if you want to see how the threads are interacting with each other, you can also do that. Um, there's also now a command for generating a static HTML report. So you can share that. You can post it online. And they don't have to be running Smiley. They can just look at the output. And it works the same way as the web app. Um, it doesn't have the filtering capabilities. You sort of build a report and publish that. Uh, and that gave me the idea that maybe you want to share the raw data with somebody. If you've got a development team and you're trying to figure out a problem, you can export a run from one database and then import it into another database. And there's separate sets of commands to do those things. Um, each of these cycles followed the same uh, learn, build, evolve steps that I talked about earlier. Um, all of it was done over the course of a couple of years, although I didn't actually spend full time working on it at any point. So these are the days on which I actually committed code to the repository. Um, uh, I've, and it, the, the number is the number of lines of code at that point on that, the end of that day. So every day I probably had a couple of different commits, uh, adding or removing lines. But uh, to sort of simplify it, I, I've smoothed all of that out. And if we accept that lines of code for a brand new project uh, is a rough analog for project feature and um, complexity growth over time, then you can see that it gives a relatively steady progression over the lifetime of the project. Um, there is that one big jump there at the end of 2013. And that's um, when I wrote the report feature, I committed in one big commit uh, a bunch of CSS and, um, and uh, uh, template code for that static generator. And that was sort of all a bunch of code that I didn't even write. It just needed to be in the project. So I committed it all at one time. And that kind of jumped the line numbers. But that, that wasn't actually as significant a, a change in complexity as it looks like. Uh, and of course, you know, this is like 20 or, or 30 days where I was actually working on it. There were a bunch of days where I worked on it, but I didn't commit any code. So I was reading. I was figuring out a tool. I was sort of noodling around in a, in a scratch directory and that sort of thing. Um, but I think if you, you look at it over time, you can see that it actually started from zero lines and it grew relatively slowly up into a, a moderately complex program. Most of the code was actually things I was able to find and reuse and just sort of glue together to build this thing. <laughs> there are still a bunch of things I'd like to do to make it even more useful. Um, performance is probably the biggest need. So it's, it's pretty, pretty slow to collect this much data and to process it. Um, it slows your program down, but it's actually also slow itself. Uh, Pre-calculating and storing the collapsed trace views would probably be a good way to, to sort of fix that. Um, there are a bunch of UI enhancements, like being able to search for things, look, you know, find all of the places where a particular value shows up in a variable, or find all of the places where a, va a variable actually changes. So you don't have to read through the whole program. Um, doing differences between two runs, that sort of thing. So if you're interested in getting involved and helping out, check out the code. Um, hit me on uh, IRC or via email or something. Um, I would love to have some other folks helping. Uh, I'm going to try and make it to the sprints tonight. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. But if I'm there, I'll probably be working on this. Um, and at this point, I think we have a couple of minutes left if folks want to ask questions. Um, do you have a URL for your slides? I don't yet, but I'll publish that on Twitter. Yeah. Hey, Doug. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm noticing that the project activity is basically what you have up on the screen there. Uh, yeah. It's been a little while. So you're, you're soliciting for help with it. But what kind of features do you have in mind? And is one question. Um, in particular, I'd be interested to see if there's any kind of like with an actively running program as opposed to something that is post-mortem, um, if you're considering features like that. And the other question I have is if you've uh, found any kind of standards with the data formats uh, with regards to profiling or debugging, or if you've, you, know, you, you show a lot of SQL in which you come with your own format. But is there a way maybe to have multiple tools working together with a standard format in this space? Sure, yeah. Um, so. Um, first question was, uh, what features would I like to add? So I mentioned uh, 
some querying capability and differencing. It would be really cool to, for example, have a view that shows all of the calls into a given function, what their inputs were and what their outputs were, so you can understand uh, if I call a function in different ways, why it might be coming out with different results than I expect. Um, the, the kinds of things that you would interactively do in a debugger, or maybe you'd write unit tests passing different data and sort of see what's happening. Um, uh, the third question, uh, so you gave me three and I've already forgotten the other two. So just yell out. Re, 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 okay, so a program that's running, sort of attaching to it and tracing what it's doing. That would be a little tricky. It might be possible. Um, I kind of had in mind that you would know you were in a debugging state uh, because you have to in, inject that trace function. You have to tell it to turn that on and off. Um, so I would have to give that some thought. You, I don't know. So like norm, uh, 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 I know some. There are some debuggers that work that way for other languages. So I'd have to give some thought about how you might do that with Python. Um, the the start and end would be a little tricky to sort of capture at that point. But yeah, yeah, that that's an interesting idea. And then um, the third one was data format. So. Um, the, the discovery of gprof to dot was a really nice feature, and I guess the profiler records data in a, a format that is sort of shareable and reusable. Um, the, uh, the trace data, I, I was not aware of anything that was doing something really similar to this, so I didn't really look for a standard, but if there is a standard out there, it would be relatively easy because that code is isolated. It would be relatively easy to pick a, the same format. Um, I kind of built it in a way that supported the features that I wanted um, at, at, the, at the time with sort of querying and exploring that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if there are standard data formats for that. Um, I think the JSON thing that I'm doing is actually a big part of the performance issue. So as far as features, uh, having some better way to serialize that data and ship it over the wire would, would probably improve performance. And that may lead to the same sort of thing, where if there's a standard format for that, using the standard format might be faster. Oh, sorry, you had one first. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I had a question. Um, have you run Smiley in Smiley running on a, another <laughs> program? Like, did you use it to debug itself? Um, and, we, uh, and a follow-up question, have you used it on any other Python, uh, like the HTTP server or something more complex than um, test program? Yeah, so I have used it on more complex programs than the simple script that I showed here. Um, that was sort of where I discovered that collecting the data was extremely slow. Um, so I used it on some of the OpenStack command line tools where it wasn't the OpenStack service, it was the command line tool that was talking to the service and the API and, and doing a bunch of different things. Um, and I think I ran it on itself. I don't remember whether that worked or not because of the trace hook and you can really only register one of those at a time and it might have, you know, broken itself. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there was one over here too. Yeah. Um, so trying to understand the uh, design decisions that you made. Now, when you were trying to build a debugger, uh, why did you start, f uh, not start with something like PDB uh, and try to enhance it, but go from a different direction? Like, I've been yeah, thinking so of building something similar, but I didn't really know where exactly to start. Uh, so if you can say something about that. Sure, yeah, so uh, PDB is a great interactive debugger, um, and adding features like this to, to PDB, you know, that might be a, a really useful thing. I don't actually like interactive debuggers that much, so I'm, I'm kind of a print and logging based debugger guy. Um, and so I wanted something that was gonna support my method of running. You know, I didn't wanna have to sit there and say, continue, 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 or register breakpoints and things like that. Um, I wanted, all of the data because I didn't know in advance what variables might be interesting. So I just wanted to sort of collect everything. And I thought, you know, there, nobody's done this as far as I was able to find. It's possible that there are other projects like this, but uh, the, it just seemed different enough to sort of take a completely different tack and do that exploration after the fact. Um, also, a lot of the stuff that I work on tends to be long running things, and you might not actually see a problem show up in a period of time that is useful for an interactive debugging session. So if I could run a process over a long period of time and collect its output and see the failure at the end and then sort of work my way backwards in the trace run and figure out what was going on, 
Um, that, that seemed like a, a, a nice feature. So, and I think the, somebody else had, there you are. Yeah. yeah, just a comment on the slide. Uh, since people aren't as old as some of us here, it's uh, the original OB1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alec Guinness, Alec, right? Alec Guinness. Yeah, so that was another big, I knew he had been Smiley in some older movies, um, and uh, so I, that was another reason for picking the name. All right, thanks everybody. I really appreciate you coming out.